You may have a seat, be seated, tell the person next to you, you look amazing, you look really good. You look even better at church. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Man, what a wonderful thing it is to be in the house of God, isn't it? Well, two people. Okay, let's try that again. What a wonderful thing it is to be in the house of God, amen? Uh, so that sounds like CFS now. I love it, I love it. Uh, why don't we do something? Why don't you open up your, your Bibles? We're going to get right to it. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Um, last week we covered the first installment of this awesome, awesome series called Dealing with Indifference. Dealing with Indifference. Honestly, I received so many calls, so many messages about just people being impacted by the Word of God, by what God is doing. I don't know if you were here last week, but I pray that you get a chance to hear uh, what the Lord began to do last week is more of the diagnosing and the prescription of indifference, you know? What do you, how do you know you're being indifferent? We talked about how indifference is the, the worst sickness of the heart. More couples, more marriages have died of indifference than anything else. Indifference robs you from living. Indifference robs you from receiving everything that God has for you. Indifference makes everybody else a problem. Indifference may make you righteous in your own eyes. Indifference is a terrible thing. Indifference, guys, for just a second, stop being indifferent. <laughs> indifference is one of those things that will destroy your relationship with Jesus quicker than sin and any other sin out there. Indifference is not a feeling. Indifference is not the feeling of not feeling. Indifference is the decision. It's the, you could even say the, oh, the conviction. Because sometimes it goes that deep in people's lives that there is no change. That nothing will ever be different. That no matter what they do, no matter where they go, what they try, nothing's going to change. It's stonewalling. It's at the end of the day saying, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. You guys have heard that. Uh, me say that before. I learned this in psych, uh, psychology class. Uh, that people who roll their eyes have a 60% chance higher of divorce than people who don't roll their eyes. Some of you guys are rolling your eyes like, it's dumb. You know what? It's not the rolling of the eyes. It's the attitude of, I don't care. I don't, whatever. Uh, uh, whatever. You know, like, I don't care what you're saying. I don't, I don't care. I just don't care. Talk to the hand. Do you guys say that still? No, okay, never mind. All right, well, whatever it is that cool people say nowadays, it used to be cool back in the day. But however, we can become very indifferent towards many things. We become indifferent towards pain. We can become indifferent uh, towards each other. We can become indifferent, you know, towards our own progress, towards our own development, towards the promises of God in our lives. But there's nothing more dangerous than becoming indifferent to Jesus himself. Today we're going to cover vertical indifference. How could a person become indifferent to the Lord? The one who is so good, the one who is so incredible. I want to take you to the scripture and I want to pray that in the next 33 minutes and 27 seconds that you're able to receive everything that God has for you. Eoni preached on Friday, an amazing message. You know, those, the, 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 the idea, the heart, the concept of being indifferent to the scripture. To be indifferent to the word of God. To be unfazed by the very thing that created this world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word meaning Jesus. To be indifferent towards the Word of God. I want to take you to a part of the Bible that perhaps it's a, it's a scary part of the Bible, but it's a beautiful part. It's in Mark chapter 6. Let me know when you got it. Mark chapter 6 verse 1. Unfair. It's going to be up here. Mark chapter 6 verse 1. It says the following. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. By the way, what's his own country? Nazareth. Good job, guys. Nath Nazareth. Nazareth. Okay. So he came back to Nazareth. It says that. Where's Jesus from? Oh, good job. Okay, cool. So he went back to? All right. Now, when he, when he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man mm -mm -mm, get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, 
and in his own house. Now he could not, now check this out, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then they went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Close your eyes. Thank you, Lord, so much because I know that you're speaking. Thank you for your word. We ask you that you do your perfect work in us. God, we don't want to leave this place the same. Lord God, please change us from the inside out, God. Do your mighty work inside of us. Lord, take this word where I cannot. Lord, would you please, Holy Spirit, do what no man can do. Bring transformation, bring change into every family in here. In your name we pray, amen and amen. This part of the Bible is so beautiful because this is Peter in chapter 6 of his book writing to us about Jesus going to Nazareth for a second time. Now this is important. Jesus had already been to Nazareth back once. It just so happens that the last time that he went, they tried to stone him to death. And they actually tried, the Bible says that they tried to throw him from a ledge. They tried to kill him. And instead of killing him, Jesus walked through them and just said, forget this. You're not ready for me. And I love that Jesus came back. He came back. Listen, Jesus came back a second time. I love a God of second chances. I love a God that even if you reject, he still gives you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. Don't you love a God of second chances? Amen. I love that because Peter wrote this. See, Peter knew firsthand the Jesus of second chances. And I believe that Jesus wrote this second account, not Luke, not John. I believe that Peter, he writes this. I mean, uh, yeah, Peter, he writes this. He allows this to be there. Now listen, how many of us here can say, I mean, how many of us here can say, God, you've given me second chances. I have a hard time saying seconds because for me it's like 50 seconds, 60 seconds, 70 seconds. Just today, God gave you like 16 chances. We're here today because God is a God of second chances. A God who, amen, give God a round of applause. He deserves it. Why not? Mark writes this. I said Peter, didn't I? Mark is a man who was acquainted with the Lord, a man who knew Jesus. How many of us could say today, Lord, thank you so much. Because even though I rejected you, because even though I pushed you away, somehow, someway, you still find a way to chase after me, to come after me. If you know if you're in his house today, it's not a part of the sermon. I just want you to know this. If you're in his house today, it's because he invited you. It's not because some cute girl brought you. Or because your daughter's been praying or your father's been praying for you or your mom didn't stop nagging you. It's not because, well, I guess they're all going, so I got to go. It's because God brought you to his house. The Bible says that nobody comes to him unless he's drawing you to himself. He's a king, and nobody approaches a king unless he summons him. And I want to tell you today, God loves you so much, he brought you to his house. Amen. I love Jesus so much. I want to get into this, bi this scripture, but I want you guys to know this. If you're here for the first time, today's word is not easy. Today's word is real. What I want to share with you, I pray that you get past the offense. If I'm offending you, I apologize ahead of time, not for the word that's going to be delivered, but for the pain that you may feel through this scripture. But I pray that you stick to it through the end. That you could say, God, keep my heart open. Because as I just read, the people that knew Jesus, his brothers, his sisters, the people from his own town, the Bible says that they were offended at him. They were offended. The Bible says that they were amazed. Literally says they were amazed. They were astonished. And yet they were offended. It is possible to be amazed at God and still be offended. It is possible to say, God, you're amazing, but I want nothing to do with you. It is possible to believe in the power of God, to see the miracles of God, and still have no relationship with him. It is possible to live around people that love Jesus, to be in the house of God even. Be amazed by who he is and still be offended at God. I want to tell you that there are many things that cause indifference in your life. If you're here today and the word is not touching your heart, if the word of God doesn't change you, doesn't move you, it's not because he has no power. But maybe other things began to operate. One of those could be an offense. Maybe somebody let you down. Maybe uh, you prayed to God and it didn't happen. Grandma still passed away. Or maybe, just maybe, the job didn't come through. Or maybe you thought by this time you'd be married with children and it hasn't happened yet. 
Or maybe, just maybe, you're offended at somebody that some preacher said. I remember one time I sat here and I was preaching and I felt like telling somebody that I didn't even know. It's like, why are you blaming me for the previous pastor? I didn't do anything to you. And after the service, the person that, I didn't put him on blast. I just said it, but I knew who it was for. And right after I said, how did you know? I was like, I don't know. I just said it. But was it true? And she began to weep. She began to cry. And she said, I wasn't listening to anything at all because the church that I came from, it hurt my family so much. Why am I telling you this? Because offense has a way of pulling you away from the love of God, from the people of God. You know, offense has a way of distancing you from your family, from people that love you, people that you love. Offense robs you of your years. You could be offended at, for the dumbest things. Sometimes I, I counsel couples and we talk about what they're mad at and they forgot what they were mad at. They just remember that they're mad. So what, did the, what was the fight about? And she's like, Um, I don't know, he started it. And like, well, what was the fight about? I go to the one who started it. And he's like, uh, uh, I don't know, I just, she's crazy. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a good explanation, but we still don't know why you were mad. And then they remember, and it was like the dumbest thing. It was like, really, guys? Like, really? Offense has a way of distancing you from people that you should be giving your life for. Isn't it true? It could begin with an offense, but indifference is the root, no, it's not the, it's not the root, it's the fruit of offense. Now listen, there are many causes for this. I want to break it down into three that we see in this part of the Bible. But like I said, bear with me. The first reason why you have become indifferent towards the things of God. You may say, preacher, I'm not indifferent towards the things of God. I'm here, aren't I? Bear with me for a second. Don't get so offended. You're indifferent towards the things of God. Let me show you why. The Bible says that these people, they were offended at him. But it began somewhere. When they saw Jesus, they said, this man, is he not a carpenter? No, is he not the carpenter? It began with this. This man. Was he this man? Is he all just a man? And he was all man, but is he just a man? They degraded the Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the miracle worker, the Messiah into the man. Can I ask you, if you're not indifferent, who is Jesus to you? Does he have authority in your life to call the shots or is he this man? He's my grandma's main man. He's my mom's Jesus. He's not your Lord He's this man. Again, you're going to get offended. But is he this man or is he the Christ to you? You see, because to them, they knew him. I'm sorry to tell you, but you don't know Jesus like they did. They walked with him. They saw him. They lived with him. Listen, these were the people of his town. They went to Nazareth High with him. They took woodshop with Jesus. They knew Jesus. Am I making sense? Like Jesus is the guy that every girl had a crush on, but he didn't give him the time of day. I ain't got time for you. He's not my time yet, he said. Listen, they knew him. But to them, he was just Chucho, Jesus. To them, he was just Jay. He's Jesus. To them, he was just this man. To them, he was just a man. Is he Jesus, the Christ? And if he is just this man to you, what is the fruit of having just this man instead of this Jesus the Christ? What would your life look like? What would our lives look like if we knew and gave him that authority as not this man, but as Jesus the Christ? You see, because there was a difference between the people in his town and the people that followed him, the people that were his disciples. To his disciples, he wasn't just this man. He was this Jesus Christ. To them, he wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a good idea. He wasn't just, just someone who could make him better. He was the way, the truth, and the life that nobody came to the Father except through him. He was worthy of our honor, our respect, our obedience. But how many of us have said, I don't agree with this. Let's just agree to disagree. You could do that with me. But to do that with Jesus? I don't know if we're offended just yet to the degree where change could happen. 
But I believe with all of my heart that the indifference that comes from your heart is not because he doesn't care or because he doesn't love you, but because you have degraded who he is to this man. Is he sovereign? You know what sovereignty means? It's no longer preached about. We talk about the cash ATM like Jesus who can provide and give you and make you rich and famous and healthy. And if you're struggling, then he must not love you. It couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus is not your genie. Jesus is sovereign. He stands above you and I and our opinion. And the day that you don't get your way, he's still Jesus Christ. And that's something that's so hard for some people to understand. Why? Because he's this man. When you ever have a controversy in your heart about God and you get to disputing him, I'm sorry, guys. This is the, this is the truth. You will dispute with him all day long when he's this man. When he's who he says he is, his word is sovereign. His word stands above your opinion, above your feelings, above your thoughts, above your understanding and lack thereof. Well, I don't get it. I'm sorry that you don't get it. Okay, to my kids, they're still young enough to where I'm not this man. I'm their dad. Now, for my 11-year-old and 7-year-old and 3-year-old, because I said so, still carries weight. Mm -mm -mm. Let's go, pastor. That's not good parenting. All right. Don't call me. It's like every parent that doesn't want to let their kids go to church until they can't go to church. My kids, sometimes, just for the fun of it, I'll tell them, because I said so. It's not for the fun of it. It's because they need to understand that their way is not their way. Oh, that's not, you're not valuing him. You need to get down to his level. Okay. Don't call me later. I'm telling you right now, the main issues in our life are not because you're not smart, because you don't have education, because you don't have an understanding of the world, because you were deprived of PlayStation 3. Your main issues is because you don't understand the sovereignty of God, because you still think that it's a democracy and it's a theocracy. Because we still think that God somehow, some way owes you something. I'm sorry, American. God doesn't owe you anything. He's not this man. He's Jesus. And that is so hard to preach. You have no idea how hard I'm right. I'm like, oh. I pray that the new person can get past the offense of them devaluing the Christ. He's just this man. You know what? They didn't just say this man. They said the carpenter. Oh, the carpenter, as though it was the meaning. Can, can I say a side thing real quick? Just, this is like a, a side. This is for free. You don't have to give another offering. Okay, this is just a side. Okay, Jesus, it was so beautiful to understand this. Jesus did public ministry for around three years, three and a half, say three years. But he did private ministry, ministry, ministry? Mexicans, man. What did private ministry? Ministry, ministry, ministry for 30 years. He said, Come on, Pastor. Okay, let's just say for 15 years. Back then, these kids they would begin their father straight, they would begin to work not when they're like 24 guys, you know, they're guys like 40 year old guys. They began to work, they were gonna put in the work at 15. They already had their trade, some of them already had three kids <laughs> by the time they were 15. They became men. They had rites of passage. We'll talk about that another day. I didn't experience that. I didn't have a father telling me, here it is, take the baton. But they did. They had a different culture. By the age of 15, Jesus would have already been building, I don't know, beds. He would have already been, some people say that it's also coupled with masonry. Maybe he'd be building amazing things, fixing things. I wonder how many of these people said, oh yeah, I remember that boy, that man. I remember that carpenter. I still have a, 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 a table that he fixed. I remember taking him our chairs. I remember whenever we needed, you know, some stuff at the house. I remember Joe would send Jay to fix our stuff. I just needed to say this because sometimes we feel like the public ministry is where it's at. And that's where God gets glory. But I think it's in the private ministry where Jesus showed so much faithfulness. I can imagine, like I said, the Bible's not thick enough. So it doesn't say what he did. All I know is this, that he glorified his father with everything that he did. So for 15 years, nine to five, carpentry. 
For 15 years, he paid his taxes. For 15 years, he provided for his family as being the older son. The Bible doesn't tell us anymore about Joseph, the story, and it's believed by many theologians that he died early in his age. So the older man, the older son would become the father of the house. And for 15 years, he would take care of his family. For 15 years, he would just do the mundane. You know, it is just as holy. I would tell you this. God gets so much glory from just doing the little things that nobody sees, that nobody seems to care about. Loving your family, caring, providing, being there for them is just as holy as the public ministry. Amen. Your family is your first ministry. Amen. So Jesus, the carpenter. Okay, I got to get, I'm stuck here. Why the carpenter? He could have chosen welder. <laughs> he could have, I kidding not But he could have chosen any other trait. Imagine him, he's sitting in his high school and they have like, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the day where you get to choose your career? What do you call that? Where the career. career day. So he's sitting in career day and he's like right there, you know, he's, he's like <laughs> engineer and politician. I don't know. He sees all these amazing things. And he sees carpenter. And he's like, oh, oh, carpenter, carpenter. And it says the carpenter, meaning there wasn't that many carpenters in Nazareth. The carpenter. I don't know what led Jesus to be the carpenter. You know, his father's straight, maybe, but I think it's more than that. I think it's God who still works in building people's lives. I think God loves to get his hands dirty. I think God loves to build lives. I think God's still in the business of preparing and repairing. I think God still wants to get his hands dirty. Am I making sense? I don't know. It's just kind of a weird thing that I'm like, okay, I love that. That's so awesome. I want to be a carpenter too. <laughs> What if I asked you right now, what do you think these people meant by the carpenter? We know him. He's no one. How could he do such thing? He's not the Messiah. He's the what? It's just the carpenter. He's this man. It's possible to think that you know God, to think that you already know enough. It's possible to have so much in your head and so little in your heart. You know, it's possible, it is possible to think that you know Jesus and only know a part of him. I love diamonds, not because I wear them or anything like that, because I've learned about diamonds and how beautiful it is. There's something called fire. A diamond has fire. It's a fire, fire, right? It's all these cuts that it has. It's polyphacetic, meaning it has many faces. I think that Jesus is like that, like a, like a diamond. The more faces you get to know, the more you see of it, the more the fire shines, the more you see the beauty of it. And some of you have only known two faces, two pieces, two facets, two components, and you're like, that's it, I already know God. And you're like, man, if you're missing out, man, you're missing out so much. Some of you could say, well, I've been walking with God for 10 years, and I already know him. Bro, you don't even know your wife. You don't even know your kids. You think they're at school. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, you don't even know. Sometimes I think I know Eoni. I've been married 15 years now, and I'm like, so who is this woman? <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing to continue to discover, to continue to get to know your lover, isn't it? Same thing with Jesus. It's like, God, do you really know Jesus? Or did you know the Jesus that you knew 15 years ago, but stopped knowing who he was and who he is now? It doesn't mean that he's different. It just means there's so much depth to him. To think that you already know Jesus because you came to church. To think that you already know Jesus because you grew up in certain Catholic church or certain Protestant church or because grandma was a missionary or because your mom was a, I don't know, you know, a prayer warrior or your dad was a pastor or a minister. You think you know Jesus because of that. It's funny because these people thought they knew Jesus. Check out what they say. Listen, second point. First point is indifference comes from over-familiarity. Just become familiar with Jesus. Too familiar. Jesus is everywhere, isn't he? People become so familiar with Jesus. That they begin to lose awe. They begin to lose wonder of him. You see, when you were growing up, Jesus was everywhere. He was in the, in the gold chain that was hanging around your neck. Or maybe the Jesus that was hanging on grandma's wall. The Jesus that you would pray for before you ate. Jesus being everywhere. But I want to tell you this. You can become so used to his presence. So used to talking about him. You can even become so used to the fact that he will be there tomorrow. And you begin to devalue him so much. You begin to think and to believe that just because he's faithful, he's not valuable. Man, you could get used to something that's there and not realize how valuable it is. Some people say you don't know what you have until you. But the crazy thing about Jesus is that he's relentless and he loves you. Can you see why it's hard? 
And you see why it's difficult to not become overly familiar with his presence when you hear the same songs and when you pray the same type of prayers? You have to get to know Christ always more. It's so difficult, guys. So difficult for a person who's just religious to truly know Jesus. It's not about sitting your butt in these chairs. It's about saying, God, I need to know you. I long for you. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after thee. Meaning, God, I need you. It's not about saying, fine, I'll go. I'm sorry, you're so indifferent. And I'm not sorry that you're indifferent towards God. I'm sorry that you're going to miss everything that indifference stops you from receiving. You see, these people thought they knew Jesus. And I want you to catch the next part. I'm glad that the kids are on the other side because I need to explain it properly. If you weren't offended yet... The next point may hurt you, but it's going to bless you afterwards, I promise you. Is that okay? It says that they said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? It doesn't say the son of Joseph. It says the son of? The son of Mary. And now I know for us, it's like, that's no big deal. John chapter 6 verse 42 says the son of Joseph. But in this second time, they don't say the son of Joseph. They're trying to attack him. You see, in this culture, you weren't called the son of your mom. You were called the son of your father. A Jewish man, a Jewish boy would know that he is the son of like Elijah, Josiah, Mateo, the son of Pablo. That's in the Jewish culture. That's then. But to say that he was a son of Mary, it was literally calling him a bastard. It's saying your father's not your father, is he? It's saying we know that you were... Yeah, born by immaculate conception like your mother claims. But to me, you're the son of Mary. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand that when they said, you are the son of Mary, they were not only not saying that he's God, they were saying he's an illegitimate, illegitimate son. You're just the bastard. You're just the one who doesn't have a father. They didn't just become indifferent. Now they began to attack because they were offended. Why were they offended? Because he was above them, because the one who was one of them now began to be honored by the Father. Because now the one that should have just been one of the crowd began to bless the crowd and heal the crowd and care for the crowd. Because he wasn't just one of them. Because now he was for them and they couldn't receive that. Have you seen that in our culture before? When you start doing something that <laughs> other people won't do and they start saying that you're lucky... Or they start saying, oh, that's because you have these privileges. You know, I've been told that before. You have the family you have because you grew up in church. My God, you know how many people grew up in church? I would say, but I don't because I'm a pastor. You have the family you have because... But I'm a pastor, so I can't say it. The fact of the matter is this. They were mad at Jesus. They were offended by his life. They were offended by his works. They were offended by his miracles. They were offended by what the father was doing through him. So they started insulting him and they said, the son of Mary. You see, they had gotten their theology from each other, not from the word of God. The second thing that leads you to indifference, the first one is over familiarity. The second one is not knowing the word of God. I'm yet to meet a person that loves the word of God and is indifferent towards the Lord. You know, the more you know the word of God, the more you fall in love with him. The more you get to know him, the more you want to know him. Your laziness towards the scripture is causing so much indifference inside of your heart. And no one else will tell you that because you'll get mad. If your wife tells you, you're going to be like, oh yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Holy One, Mrs. Holy One, what's your devotional? Is it true or not? No, it's not true. Nobody else will tell you. You don't read the word. You don't know the word of God. I know pastors become annoying when they tell you to read the word of God. So I'm going to say it in the least annoying way possible. Read the word of God. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Well, I don't like reading. I know. Stay dumb spiritually. Or read the word of God. I say spiritually, okay? Don't get offended. But how many of you, your theology is based on Instagram little, like, snippets? Dude, you have no idea how many people send messages, and I answer them because I love people. They, Pastor, do you see this? I'm like, are you serious? Okay, 
Where do you get your theology? Where do you know Jesus from? Through who, let's just say? Okay, I, this, is how I, I, this is how I get it, okay? Like, okay, I was translating. I hope nobody gets mad. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I got to interpret it in, in the city this week. I, I had to do interpretation for government. This, 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 uh, I got to interpret for, oh, I hope they're not watching. I hope nobody's watching from that interpretation day. But they were talking about health. They were talking about eating habits. And they were talking about how we can make the southeast cities healthier. Do you know what they gave for lunch? Tamales. <laughs> Fried chicken. And grape. <laughs> Kid you not. I was sitting there and I was looking at the presentation. And the lady that was giving the presentation was huffing and puffing by the third slide. I wasn't criticizing. I was just saying, this is, this is not. This is. And the Lord spoke to me. I kid you not. This is how it is with your cell leaders. And I said, no, Lord, it isn't. <laughs> this is how it is with your cell leaders. They're out there talking about God and spiritual health. Eating spiritual tamales on Instagram. Are you kidding? Where are you getting your theology from? And I'm not claiming to be a theologian, neither should you. The moment you start doing that, you start looking down and be like, ah, eh, actually this, actually that. And you think you got the correction ministry. And you don't have the correction ministry. You don't. Like you don't. You know, you think you're smart, but your life will give fruit. But the crazy thing is this. Where do you get your word from? Some people get like, you know, birds, they eat. And they regurgitate it. And then they put it on their mouth. And that's a picture of how many people, that's the extent of the depth of the knowledge of God. Not because it's not available, because they're just too lazy to go and get it. I told you you were going to get offended. Before you walk out, let me tell you this. The beauty of discovering the knowledge of God. The beauty of knowing Jesus firsthand. I don't know if we got that picture of the cross and the lip. Okay, I heard about fasting. I had talked about fasting. And, you know, we, we used to fast. Deoni and I, we grew up fasting. Until one day we were truly confronted with what actual fasting is. Like deep fasting. It wasn't like, I'm not going to go on Instagram for three hours. I'm going to fast. It wasn't like, I'm fasting from oranges. It was like, I'm actually going to seek the Lord. I'm fasting for some of you. It's like, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm, I'm doing the keto fast. I'm doing the carnivore fast. And I'm just going to throw some prayer in there so Jesus will bless it. Listen, if you're going to do a diet, do the diet. No shame in your game. Do it. Awesome. I hope it works. Study. Make sure you get your vitamins. But when you're fasting, you fast. We have to make important decisions. And you see, I had gotten my understanding of fasting through books, through other people, through my mom. And then I began to fast. And I said, Lord, I want to know that the next step we're taking towards CFF, it's real. We don't want to make this step just because. God, there's so many important decisions happening. Lord, there's so much going on in our lives, so many critical moments. I love New Gen. New Gen was a church where, honestly, to be very honest, is where I caught this, this, this passion for Jesus, passion for ministry. Some of you who are here, we just merged these two beautiful churches, CFF and New Gen, and God's doing a beautiful thing, isn't he? Give God a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful thing. You're clapping now, but it was hard. Our family went through tough times. My sister Marisol, Chris is here. It's not easy. But let me tell you something. I remember having all these critical moments and decisions. And then I heard about fasting. We read this book about fasting. Then we fasted for 21 days. No food, nothing, just water, agüita, that's it. Just water and prayer. It wasn't just water. It was prayer and seeking God's face. I want to show you a picture real quick. Go ahead and, and put it up there if you have it. Oh, that looks really weird. But yeah, I don't know if you could tell, but this is a cross, okay? It's like a, it's, it looks weird like this, but is there a video there? Will it look as weird as this? Okay, that's better. Okay, I don't know if you could tell. This is like actually a canker sore. So it looks a lot bigger right here. It was pretty big. So that's a canker sore in my lip, and that's my yellow teeth. Don't look at that. <laughs> but I remember going to the doctor, and the doctor said, did you burn yourself? I said, no, I'm here because I've been fasting for 21 days. Why would you do such a thing? He was an atheist. I said, was. Hey. Amen? Yeah. Now, give God a round of applause if you understood what I just said. Okay, so this crazy cross came on my lip, and I would tell you the scriptures that the Lord gave to Eoni and I. We weren't just going to preach. 
what we would say would be on behalf of God. We didn't want to just stand up and say stuff. We wanted to know that his word would impact people's lives. And it was so beautiful to see what happened after that, how many people began to fast, how many people in the church, young people, caught fire. I had parents call me saying, my son is not eating. Tell him to eat. I'm like, your son is 150 pounds away. He's going to be all right. He's going to be all right. He, he can go for four years. I'm just nah, 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 no, no. Okay, so it was so cool because people began to fast and seek the Lord. People began to go into the presence of God. You know what happened? Dumb arguments began to fall off. Like, God can't use me? Not around. Ouch. Like, I don't know if this is for me. You know why? Because people began to know firsthand. Because a person with an experience will never be at the mercy of someone with an argument. You could argue all you want, but I know him. I've experienced his love, his power. That's just one tiny little thing. I could tell you on and on and on of personal experience with the power of the living God. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. What is your experience with God? Please take that down. It's kind of weird. <laughs> what is your experience with God? That's one, like I said, we've seen the power of God. I know many of you have many testimonies where you should have been dead and the Lord saved you in the nick of time. Amen. Man, how many of you here can recognize that God has provided supernaturally where you should not have been able to get through that month and the Lord... Send ravens your way to pay for the month. Amen. Give God a round of applause. How many of us know someone and that should not know but knows today? You were so far from God and yet God ruined you. But what happens is this, is that we get our theology from second hand. And don't get me wrong. There's some great sources out there. I think coming to church, just like Jesus, we go to the synagogue. It's powerful. Iron sharpening iron. We always say this, I don't believe in organized religion. Well, we're not that organized, keep coming. <laughs> it's crazy how many people have dumb arguments because they don't read the scripture. I know, guys, I know it's, it's not something you're used to. Look, I went through entire, in my entire high school, I read only one book, and it was Call of the Wild. And it's this thick about a dog. And that's it. I got through my psychology, okay. I'm not going to give you guys any encouragement, young people. But if you didn't read those books, fine. But the word of God will save your generations. Give God a round of applause. Amen. Third thing, and I'm going to finish with this. First thing is over familiarity that draws you at the causes indifference. Second thing is wrong theology that causes indifference. And third thing is what we began with, and that is offense. Just offense. It begins with something so small, like I didn't like the sermon, or I didn't like the word, or I didn't like the way they looked at me. Or I went to one church one time, and the preacher talked too much about money, so I didn't go back. Fine, don't go back to the preacher, but go back to the presence of God. How many times people leave the church, and I wish they would leave to go search after the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But if I had a dollar for every person that left and said it was our fault, or your fault, or grandma's fault, or that leader's fault, Instead of saying, I'm a human, you're a human, you make mistakes, I make mistakes, we let each other down, but God has never let me down. I have no reason to leave my father's house. I have no reason to stop serving my king who has given me everything. I have no reason, no argument that stands, truthfully stands. Am I making sense with that? Because how many times we get offended and that root of offense causes indifference? indifference and it grows and it grows and it grows and you know when indifference grows it robs you of everything let me put it like this the bible says we finish with this the bible says that these people were astonished but they did not receive the power of god it literally says that they were astonished but you know who else was astonished jesus was the bible says that jesus was astonished at their lack of faith you know how weird that is? That if you're going to amaze God, it's because you either don't have faith or you have a lot of faith. Two times Jesus was astonished. One time, by this man who told Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the words. Just say the words. And Jesus is like, wow, I'm amazed. The second time he's amazed in the scripture, the only second time, is with these fools. That they knew him. They should have known. You know what amazes me too? Like, it really, really does. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't, like, go off script here. 
But it amazes me how many people still reject Jesus. It amazes me how many people still treat him like a mere man. It amazes me how many people can have such wrong understanding of God and criticize him when they don't even know him. How could you criticize someone who loves you so much that you don't know him? How is it possible? It's astonishing to me how many people miss out on the love of God, how many people miss out on the power of God, the healing of God, the peace of God, the forgiveness of God. You know when God gives and people miss out? Listen, the Bible says that Jesus, let's read it and we finish with it. Verse 5, and he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Okay, listen, 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 listen. I've studied this over and over and over and over. I looked at just about every commentary I could. I cross-referenced it. I looked at it in the original scripture. And every time I go back to it, I see this thing that doesn't settle properly. And so I went to the presence of God. And I said, Lord, what? happened it says that you couldn't do many miracles and then it says except a few sick people that he laid his hands on i cannot tell you this for certain but this is what i see i know that god cannot be stopped that's a fact okay it's kind of like the funny thing that people try to stop jesus with a stone you remember that in the tomb where they rolled the tomb thinking yeah that'll stop him and he flung the universe into existence. You get what I'm saying? Like what people know as the Big Bang, we call the word. <laughs> Who spoke it? Am I making sense? A little bit. Okay, so your indifference will not stop the plan of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus, even though they were indifferent, he still went on to the other towns, did miracles, went around teaching, died for you and I. He still did miracles, signs and wonders. He still raised Lazarus. He wasn't crying in the corner, like, oh, I don't believe it. I can't do it, it doesn't think I'm a girl. He wasn't broken. His heart, perhaps, was hurting, but he didn't stop. Like, your unbelief in God is not going to somehow diminish him, but it will diminish something. And here's the hard part the Bible says that he couldn't do many miracles there. And here's my answer I prayed and I said, Lord, why? Is it that you didn't have power? And here's what I saw, except for a few sick people that he laid his hands on. Listen, it is my belief, it is my conviction that the people of Nazareth were so indifferent that they did not bring them. That they did not bring out the sick, the lame. They didn't bring out the broken. It is my understanding as I read the scriptures that only a few were there. And to those few, he laid his hands on. And to them, he healed. And I began to ask the Lord, could there have been mothers there that because of the indifference that they felt, they didn't bring their sons and the grace was not poured on them? Could it be that some fathers in that place, because of the indifference they felt, they didn't bring their family with them and their names will not be remembered? Could it be that some were sick, waiting for a friend to pick them up and say, come on now, I know a Jesus who can heal you. We'll break a roof if we have to, but we're going to get you in front of him. And instead, that paralytic died a paralytic. Could it be, I don't know, but he says that those that were a little, little bit over there, just a few sick people. And my Jesus healed them. It wasn't that they stopped the power of God. It's that they opted out. They unsubscribed. They said, no. That's not for me. And I wonder how many people still today have unsubscribed and they say, no, it's not for me. Whether it is because you don't have the right understanding that he's not just the man, he is the man. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That he loves you so much that he died for you. He gave everything for you. Maybe you have the misunderstanding that because you messed up, because you already walked away and you don't realize the Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Your steps are like this. His steps are like this. He says, draw near to me. Just turn towards me and I'll do the rest of it. See, I know a God who loves you so much 
that he gave his one and only son for whoever you, if you believe in him. I didn't say if you know everything, I said just believe in him. Okay, not just believe that he exists, but believe his word, believe what he did, believe who he is, believe that he loves you and he knows you and he wants a relationship with you because that is the scripture. I'm telling you right here, right now, so many people didn't receive their healing, not because he wasn't there, he's here now. You're in his house. But because they were offended, because they were too busy, because they already knew him. Why? Because they thought they knew. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you, like my mom, were raised Catholic and she was going to be a nun. She's sitting right here, by the way. I love my mom. And I love so much to tell you this, that God loves you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what's been done to you. He loves you. With arms nailed wide open, he says, I am here and I love you. That is real theology. Jesus loves you. So where do we go from here? Please stand up for a second. It's so crazy to me because spiritual indifference has a way of robbing you from everything. It robbed an entire, the Bible says this nation, the nation of Jesus. It robbed an entire nation. Guys, guys, listen. It robbed the entire nation of the miracle working power. These people had the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in their sight. And they let them slip by. They had Jesus, the Christ. And they undermined them. They became so indifferent. I pray that today we have had fun. We got mad today. In this last 30 minutes, 33 minutes, some of you here, perhaps, maybe, the Lord spoke to you about your indifference. Maybe he confronted you with your lack of passion for the word of God. Or maybe he spoke to you about your third hand regurgitated wrong concept of God. You know, I'm not afraid at all of listening to a certain preacher because I know right away if it's Jesus is preaching or some fake you know why because I have a relationship with Jesus it's so freeing to have a relationship with God let me put it like this there's a blonde over there whom I love so much and I call wife I've known her for now 17 years roughly and sometimes she says things and I could finish the sentence. You know what I'm saying or not? Like, I know where she's going. What if you were to come and say, you know what, Pastor, no one else would tell you this, but I heard Pastor Elni say such and such and such thing. Now, other people may believe this person if it's the wrong thing or a thing that she would never say, but I know her and I would say, you know what, I know Elni and she would never say that. Let's find out what it was. Oh, no, no, don't tell them. Come here, come here, come here. <laughs> Let's find out the context. By the way, that's how you smash gossip. That's how you smash it. Make the call right there and then. Oh, you said, okay, let's go. Right now. You got minutes? <laughs> Listen, it's so cool because when you know somebody, people can attack and you could say, no, I know them. I know. I know their heart. I know who they are. And if they said it, there had to be a context. Same thing happens with God. So many people's deconstruction of their theology, their life, and they were Christian, they were no longer Christian. I'm like, dude, really? Where'd you get your theology from? What song did you get it from? What song did you get it from? There's the scripture, there's the word of God. Again, that confrontation is not easy to swallow because it's tough, isn't it? To know that you've been lagging it when it comes down to getting to know the one who knows you, who loves you, who created you. If your faith is not worth much, it's because you haven't paid much for it. It's time to pay the price, isn't it, church? It's time to say, I'm spiritually indifferent. I reach out to Instagram first before I reach out to the Word of God. I look for likes and dislikes before I look for what He likes and what He wants. Be honest with yourself. Let's be honest. I eat everything first instead of my spiritual nourishment. I've been fasting this week and I've been looking for God. And I got to tell you this, it is not easy. It's not easy to fast. It's not easy to pray. Not, if it was easy, it's not easy. 
But let me tell you what is not easy, dealing with problems without the presence of God in your life. You know what's not easy? Not having answers for the worst, terrible questions in your heart. You know what's not easy? Feeling alone even though the Lord is with you. You know what's not easy? Being confused by the things that you should have already known. You know what's not easy? Hearing the voice of the enemy attacking you when one word from God could have crushed all those accusations. That is not easy. You know what's not easy? Seeing the consequence of an unbiblical life and then hearing it from a preacher. It's not easy. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. It could change right now. Everything can change right now. Everything can change right here, right now. Everything can change. I mean it. Everything can change. How, pastor? Everything can change. I'm going to tell you a secret we finish with this. I promise. I know damn, preachers are scary when they say that, right? I don't know how to do things halfway. Like when I try to like do things halfway, it doesn't work for me. So I don't know how you work. I don't know how you, I'm not telling you you have to do it this way. But some of you here need to stand before the presence of God and say, Lord, I am sorry. I'm sorry, God, that I've been seeking for everything else except you. Lord, I'm sorry that I've given you the leftovers of my life and when I'm already tired. I'm sorry, God, if I, my relationship with you is just on Sundays. I'm sorry, God, if, if the Bible is just a book. The way you treat it is the way you read it. You know, what if today we say, God, I will seek your word first. Some of you here need to make a covenant with God. And I say some of you because some of you ain't ready. And some of you may think, oh, that's just too religious, too extreme. That's fine. You ain't ready. What if you start reaching out for the word of God first, your spiritual nourishment instead of food? Nobody said amen. Okay, good. If you say, you know what? Until I eat the nourishment of my soul, I want to nourish my body. You came here for the first time, you know what kind of church is this? I should have gone to mass. They feed you there. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, I'm just telling you right now, right here, right now, it doesn't matter what religion you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what struggles you have, you go back to the Word of God, everything gets sorted out, everything gets sorted out, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you, trust the Lord in all your ways and He will set your path straight, what if today you decide, I will eat my spiritual food before I eat my physical food, I say this with fear and trembling, why, because some of you will fail. But I pray that when you do, you get back up the next day and say, nope, I'm going to try it again. And I'm going to try it again and 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 again. And the power of again is so beautiful to say, God, I'm going to seek you first. So for those of you that want to end, you thought it was going to be a sermon. It's an action point. If you really want to end spiritual indifference, it begins with decisions. And so the decision is to seek after God first. And I want to make a covenant. We're not going to do an altar call today. We're going to pray. If you want to receive Jesus in your life, that you receive him truly. That he will be yours. And you will be his. Amen? That you ask God for forgiveness for all your sins. And that you understand with your mind. And you believe with your heart. And you confess with your mouth for salvation. We're going to do that right now. But I'm also going to pray that for some of you have been in spiritually, who have been spiritually indifferent, you will take the step and say, God, you come first. In a world where everyone gets fed everything 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 it's so good man you, your feed get it <laughs> all the time you're fed all the time but if you begin with the word of god you'll be full you'll be satisfied and everything else you're gonna be okay without or it'll just be a point of laughter it'll just be like a cherry on top it won't be your nourishment it'll just be a snack am i making sense am i making sense like like instead of eating hot cheetos you're eating like steak it's kind of like that. Hot Cheetos are just, you know, cool deal after you had your steak. Let's pray. Is that cool? Close your eyes. Let me pray with you. Dear God, right now, I thank you so much for people who want to lean into your presence. I thank you, God, for a church that is willing to do something about their faith, not just willing to talk about it. God, I thank you so much for people that are here today and they're willing to listen to such an imperfect person and yet hear the perfect word of God. I thank you, God, because there are people here who recognize that they don't yet know everything, just like myself, but we want, to. we want to know you, Jesus. We want to know you more and more and more. We want to love you more. God, we want to receive your power. God, guys, right there where you are, the Lord put something in my heart. 
I wonder how many of you have been withholding the miracles, preventing the miracles of God in your family, in your life, the next great blessing, the restorative power, the miracle signs and wonders because of your indifference, because of your familiarity with Jesus. But I believe that God wants to, just as he did in Nazareth, he wanted to heal the many, many, many. He wanted to bless them. He wanted to enrich them. He wanted to prosper them. Above all, he wanted to give them eternal life. And so if you're here today and you've been preventing things from coming towards your family because you've been distant from God, I believe right here, right now, God is opening the door to you and saying, come to me. If you're tired, you're heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come to me, he says. If you're weary, come to me, the Lord would say. Right where your eyes close, right where you are. Would you tell him, Jesus Christ, I give you my life, I give you my heart. I surrender my all to you. I ask you to forgive me, God, if I have been indifferent towards you. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving everything for me, God. I give you my life and I give you my heart. I give you my past, my present and my future. Jesus, I want to know you. I want to work with you, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. You gave your life for me. I give you my life, Lord. I'm going to make a covenant with you guys. And those of you that want to make it, that's fine. Don't feel condemned if you're not ready. But any of you that want to say, God, I want to put you first. I want to seek your word first. I'm not telling you an amount. That's something you're going to determine day by day with the king. I'm not telling you how. That's something you have to determine. But I'm telling you, if you seek first, if you come to Him first, everything will change. Putting God first changes everything. If you want to make a covenant of breaking indifference in your life, upward indifference, how about you make a covenant with me alongside me? And let's ask the Lord to give us strength and the power to see this through. Let's pray that for the next three months beginning today, and I say three months that you can carry after, but let's just stick to three months right now, where you will eat first spiritually and then physically. Where you will say, God, if I need to skip breakfast to be with you, then I'll do that. God, if in my lunch, instead of going for tacos, God, I will go for your word. God, if perhaps, perhaps, I need to go the whole day because I've been so busy without eating physically, God. And that's fine, I choose you first. For some of you need to get up a little earlier to seek the word of God, and that's okay. I could see some of you serving the cereal ahead of time and just waiting, and that's okay. Because you're putting God first. Before opening the phone, you're gonna open up the Bible. Before checking every message, you're gonna check the message of God for you today. If you want to make that covenant right now, I want you to put your hand over your heart. And for the next three months, we will seek God first. We make a covenant, God, with you right here, right now. Would you tell him, Jesus Christ, I will seek you first. I want your word before everything else, God. I want nourishment in my spirit before in my body, God. I commit, Lord, to putting you first for the next three months, God. I will not eat until I eat the word of God first, God. Lord, I pray right here, right now, that you hear my words, God. I will not open Instagram, Facebook before I open up your word, God. I declare right here, right now, that you come first in my life. You are priority to me, God. Would you end my spiritual indifference today, God? I declare that you are king. You're not just a man. You are Jesus Christ. Lord God, I enter into covenant with you. And I ask you, God, do it, please, God. Set me on fire spiritually, God. Let me burn for you, Jesus. God, I want to know you more. God, I want to know you more than I've ever known you before, God. I want to experience your presence, and I want to experience your power. If it takes five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, God, but I will feel your presence, God. I will lean into your presence, God. Right where you are, when you tell them, God, I make a covenant to seek you first. I declare right now that spiritual indifference is evicted from my life. I evict spiritual indifference from my heart and my mind. God, I came to this church not to hear but to do. God, I don't want to be a hearer of the word. I want to be a doer of the word. God, thank you 
thank you God because today I take a step towards you and you'll take many many steps towards me Jesus I love you I want to serve you for the rest of my life thank you Jesus so much I expect to hear wonderful things every day I make a commitment to be with you every day let me pray with you now and we'll finish with worship Lord I pray right now that you set miraculous appointments divine appointments with people that your word would jump at them God that you will speak to them in ways that they have never seen before God that whatever they didn't understand before they could understand it now that before they open that word and they say God Holy Spirit will you teach me that you would just teach them show them wonderful things that they do not yet know Lord thank you because you come first and this church is not playing God we want to put you first today 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 tomorrow the next day God you come first thank you Jesus we exalt your name right now. Why don't you lift up your hands and worship the King of Kings because he's worthy. Isn't he worthy?